I think Robin's death by his own hand this week was shocking to us all. All suicides are tragic. This one leaves millions of fans asking why. And we've heard about the alcohol abuse and, and all the drug addictions, the self-admittance to rehab centers, but now we've been hearing all about this week of the terrible disease of depression and his wife just sent an email out saying that he had the beginnings of Parkinson's disease as well. And while we want to remember all of our laughs from any number of the nearly 100 movies and performances, the stand-up comedies, the numerous cartoon voices, it is right now his death that is causing so much awareness in the world around us and of how little we really know about those diseases which inflicted Williams, especially depression. We all suffer to some level from various ailments or disorders or diseases. And as I reflected this week, the scripture that kept coming back to me and that I want to share a little bit with you this morning is the story of the ten lepers a diseased group. Of all the gospel writers, I think it is Luke who's the most vigorous champion for those on the outside, those on the periphery of society, those who feel lost or swallowed up, alone or marginalized. In fact, Luke is, is himself an outsider, being the only Gentile writer in a New Testament of Jewish writers. One thing that becomes obvious though as you read through the Gospel of Luke, Jesus continually reaches out to those who are treated as outsiders, especially to women, to the poor, to the racially different, and in this case, to those diseased. Listen to God's Word to you. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When Jesus saw them, he said, Go, show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? And then he said to him, Rise and go. Your faith has made you well. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord, as we come to this scripture, we do so asking for your blessing asking for your Spirit's wisdom to inspire in us to understand deeper than the superficial meaning, to understand how it might apply to our lives as we would be those who are broken, as we would want to be made whole in our lives. Through Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. So Williams himself uh, claimed to be Episcopalian. In fact, he once created the top ten reasons to be an Episcopalian, which I particularly li like number three, all of the pageantry, none of the guilt. <laughs> and he imagined the afterlife as a posh restaurant, observing death is nature's way of saying your table is ready. As time writer Richard Corliss asks for all of us, how does 
one man with a thousand voices who brought joy to millions, how could he not sustain it in himself? So how does this story teach us something about seeking life of wholeness in a broken and diseased world? Well, first you just look at the facts. The circumstances that are being told are fairly unambiguous and clear on the surface. Jesus healed ten lepers. Nine of them were Jews. One was a Samaritan. Only the Samaritan came back to say thank you. At first reading, some of the highlights that you might be thinking, and, and certainly I've also joined you in those thoughts, would be this story reminds us of all that God has done for us through the years, despite what we have been through or experienced. The story suggests that um, perhaps ingratitude is not simply bad manners, but for profanity of the worst sort, a condition just as sick as that caused by bodily disease, ingratitude. Or perhaps you read the story and it teaches us that thanksgiving in itself is a confession of faith, more potent than even medical cures in the reconstruction of life. For all ten lepers, though healed and now well, were not whole. Now it's only a Samaritan who comes back and says, thank you. And I particularly like the King James Version of the translation here. When Jesus says, arise, go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. All of them were healed, but he only claimed that one was made whole. Now, if you give this story further reflection and you go deeper into the issues that emerge, let's see what you'd find out. I would start with the Samaritan to begin with that Jesus spoke of wholeness of life and thanksgiving in terms of a Samaritan rather than a Jew is a blatant admission that you and I live in an ambiguous world. Why should a, Mar a Samaritan of all people be found in the company of nine Jews? The Jews hated the Samaritans, as you probably remember, for eight centuries. They've had a feud together, racial bigotry, and prejudice. Think Ferguson, Missouri, right now, times 10. When Jesus spoke of thanksgiving, he did so in full view of suffering and pain in the context of the injustice and oppression in a sinful world where race prejudice and religious bigotry seem to be the rule of the day. Think ISIS militants and the Yazidas, a religious minority group in Iraq. Okay, so we think a little bit about the Samaritan and what that represents in our world today. What about the disease itself, leprosy? Leprosy at that time and even now though much less around the world, is a nasty, defacing thing which leaves human beings subhuman, without hands, and without feet, and with dis undiscernible faces. And as I said, not as prevalent today, but, well, there are many other diseases that could take the place of leprosy in this story. Cancer, the Ebola virus, HIV, AIDS, what about the diseases that Williams had? Alcoholism, depression, Parkinson's. What about diseases of a different sort like prejudice, racism, apathy? And if you really go deep and really get philosophical as you're going into this story, then eventually 
you'll raise the question, why disease at all? Why were not all the lepers healed when Jesus lived, rather than only a few? And why were some healed and some were not? And why did some die and some didn't die? Why? And if you go far enough down that road of these unanswerable questions, you eventually arrive at that age-old dilemma called theodicy, the study of good and evil with questions that we have all asked at one time or another. Why do bad things happen to good people? Why is there evil in the world anyway? And I have one last question that I'd throw out to you as that this parable raises for me. Was the Samaritan, you know the background, was the Samaritan united with these nine Jews because they shared a common misery? We all know the saying, misery loves company. It is no respecter of persons. It comes to people regardless of age, race, uh, creed, class. And it binds them together in some strange community wherein there is absolutely equality of need. Have you ever wondered that that is why God allows us to suffer? The binding together of equality of need. But then you ask, what kind of God would be, would God be who could love us in such destructive ways? And I think, I love my children as much as any father loves their children. And I would do everything that I could to keep them free of pain in this world. Wouldn't I? If my children never knew pain, they would never need healing. And if they never needed healing, how would they ever know that they were well? Apart from my need, there is neither cause nor occasion for thanksgiving, without which life would be much poorer. There's one good thing about pain, the man told me as I visited him in the hospital, it makes you realize what you've got when it goes away. People often learn truths in pain that they neglect in times of greater ease. Well, those are some of the questions that I offer to you as I muse over what are the truths that I can apply in my life as a Christian and that you can apply in your life as a Christian in a world in which we live with the circumstances that surround us? I've asked these questions to offer you to take home, but I can't end a sermon on those questions. So I'll offer three quick, brief observations for you to ponder between brokenness and wholeness between disease and gratitude. First point is simply that God expects us to offer praise and gratitude. He expects it from us must mean that it must be in us, that somehow they are native to us, that what God is asking of us is only that we be as thankful as we were created to be. Praise means breaking out in the root word in the Hebrew in a spontaneous sound, as it would say in Psalm 100, make a joyful noise to the Lord. Praise God. To ask why we should be thankful in the face of earth and sky, even when the dark clouds of evil overshadow us time and time again, it's like asking why birds sing. Birds were made to sing. 
And people were made to praise. It's part of our, our spiritual DNA. It's at the very core of who we are as those made in the image of God. Then a second thing of observation. Sometimes the uncertainties of life are the things which dominate our point of view. So that we fail to see that which we have to be thankful for. The psychologist gave a bunch of business executives one of those typical tests and had an ink blot on a big white sheet of paper. And 100% of the executives, when asked, what do you see, said an ink blot. <laughs> Not one of them saw the white piece of paper. Of course, the test was unfair and it encouraged the wrong answer. We can so fix on the ink blot that we fail to see the great expanse of goodness and grace on which the blot is held. You need not look far for countless examples of those who have it worse than you do. Just look around you and you'll still see that they see goodness and beauty and joy in life. Not all the time, but that's what we're called to seek after. And as for the ink blot, my final point, if nothing in all creation is able to separate us from the love of God and Jesus Christ our Lord, we may assume that no negative circumstance is devoid of things to be thankful for. Even if the ink blot is indelible and overwhelming, the paper is still there. The New Testament was written by people facing persecution and death sometimes on a daily basis, and yet punctuated throughout the New Testament are hallelujahs here and praise the Lord there. Paul assures us in Romans 8, for I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. What you and I, I think, are offered to consider that from this story that Jesus teaches is that such praise and gratitude is in us and it seeks expression even in the pain as evidence of the fact and presence of God in our lives. It is our sign that life is a two-way street, that no circumstance, no matter how broken or diseased, is a dead-end street. Life is an ongoing conversation between God and our ambiguous and sometimes painful circumstances. It is a story of God's reaching out to us so persistently that we cannot dispute His power or his love. And it is of our response of praise and thanksgiving in the midst of it all by where we lay at his feet the gratitude that lies deep within our hearts. Likely this Samaritan was grateful for some things even in his leprosy. Otherwise, he could not have been grateful for his cure. Such is the reckless confidence of our faith as Jesus says, Arise, go thy way, your faith hath made you whole. Let us pray. Lord, be with us, we pray, as we try to make sense of the things which we don't understand the circumstances around us, knowing that you hold us in the palm of your hand. And for that, we praise you, Lord Jesus.
Amen.